Uh, I'm going to start off with a shameless plug. I'm going to talk a little bit about the work that we've done. This includes campaigns for global brands, full-on documentary series, art installations that are interactive and immersive. We've done some great things, some beautiful things, some award-winning things, things I'm really proud of, but not just for the end product. I'm also really proud of the journey, the things that it took to get there. But sometimes I don't feel like I can talk about that part, right? Even with my closest friends and family. I just don't know if they'll understand or where to start or if it's really worthy of their attention. And it's great to see all this stuff out in the world, the billboards, social media, on screens. But the end product, it's not the whole story. Here's a, a look behind the scenes. Here you see many or some of the many people that help bring our vision, our work to life. This includes people that build things from scratch, operate sophisticated camera equipment, rig up lighting and do a bunch of stuff, frankly, I don't always understand. They're people that you likely haven't met and likely never will. But they make the things you see every day, the things that inspire you, the things that move you. And that leads me to my topic for today. Feeling seen. The invisible work that we all do. The things that are done, roles that are played in the people and stories behind them. I'm gonna ask a quick question. Raise your hand if you've ever done something you're proud of, but didn't feel like you could tell anyone about it. That's most of you. I feel you. I see you. And we're going to go beyond that a bit, right? Because it's not just about this trendy phrase that refers to a moment of recognition. It's actually about finding your people, your community, and feeling like they know you're there and you know they're there. That's deep, right? Super deep. <laughs> but first off, I'm going to talk a little bit about myself. And I'm going to relate it back to this concept of visibility and why my story matters. <clears throat> I was born and raised in Seattle, yes, I'm a unicorn, to two Taiwanese immigrants, one of which is sitting right here. Hi, Mom. Um, and I was torn growing up between the Taiwanese culture at home and the American culture everywhere else. Between the subtle but daily inner turmoil stemmed from my conflicted identity, to the outright discrimination I would sometimes face from the rest of the world. I was a pretty lost kid. But then I found a home in hip hop culture. <laughs> That's me. Uh, actually, a couple years ago, right outside these doors on Red Square, shooting a um, music video for Beyonce. I'm just kidding, it was a BCU commercial. Um, but I digress. I was a true third culture kid I was thriving in this creative, uh, diverse, and very accepting world of hip hop, right? And it was all predicated on just being good at stuff, or as we would refer to it, being dope. And the definition of dope was very subjective and very loose, because at the end of the day, what we were doing was just art. We were just expressing ourselves. And that felt so empowering, and I took that to so, it took me to so many places. I traveled the world with my friends, competing in breakdance competitions. I founded the UW Hip Hop Student Association right here many years ago, like thousands of years ago. <laughs> and it's still popping today, almost quite literally. <laughs> um, I started a nonprofit focused on providing underprivileged and at-risk youth mentorship and life skills through street dance and arts. All of these experiences, all the people I've met, I've taken with me and they have informed everything I do today still. And the through line, when I look back at it all, is I went from feeling invisible, entirely invisible in my life, to finding a place where I felt truly seen. I took all this as a superpower, right? And that insight, and I got through school, here you go, go dogs, and 
I got into a successful career in advertising. I moved to New York, worked on Madison Avenue, and even met Don Draper. I'm just kidding, he doesn't exist. But I was up there in these skyscrapers, right, seeing how the proverbial sausage of hypercapitalism and consumer everything was getting made. And every moment there, I was thinking about my people. I was thinking about my community back home. I just missed them. You know, the money was good, but I also working all the time. And I never really let it go. While I was in New York, thousands of miles away, I was still organizing events back home. I would travel and dance and compete as much as I could. I would still advise and mentor and support anyone I could. And, you know, I never gave up on that. But as I rose up through the big advertising ranks, I felt increased pressure to not only hide, but shed this part of my identity. I felt like I needed to conform to the corporate culture that I was beholden to. In a way, they were telling me to become invisible again. And so I had a big decision to make. And I made it. I made it, I made it. I started my own creative agency. And as you could imagine, and some of you here probably might even be able to relate, it was transformational. Starting a business is not easy. To be independently self-sufficient, to be a small business owner. But that wasn't what it was about. The world didn't need another ad agency. What the world could always use though, was a great place to work and feel radically accepted while doing so. And that's what we were focused on. That's what we created. We created a space where you could grow, be creative, but also feel safe to be your weird, quirky, misfit self. And we took that not only as like a part of our culture values, but as our mission. It guides us through everything, through the clients we choose, the projects we choose. It helped us get through adversity, such as a global pandemic. And today it informs everything. It permeates everything we do. More than half of our work is social impact focused with a centering on diverse storytelling. And the reason why I'm framing it all like this is because when I look back, I realized the most critical thing for me in life was that I felt unseen for so long, that I felt like I didn't fit in. And it gave me that chip on my shoulder to take forward and center my life around creating that space for others and myself. But anyways, so feeling seen, it's a little buzzy, right? You've all seen the, the memes, you know, it gets mentioned a lot in shows, but, but there's a universal truth to why we talk about feeling seen. It's because we've all gone through this moment where we feel unacknowledged, overlooked, a little invisible, no matter who you are. And we're talking about that more often these days. That has allowed us to shift our perspective on visibility quite a bit. Look at the way we're looking at representation in mass media or even how we're a little bit more open and honest and vulnerable, hopefully, at home. It's personal, but it goes beyond the personal because the truth of the matter is our world is built on the quiet and relentless work of many, many people who will never be acknowledged and their names will never be known because we only see the end product. Think about what it took to get here or here. or more recently here, shout out to Michelle Yeoh. These moments in our history did not happen overnight. They took the relentless work of people fighting outside of and within the system, many of whom which knew that they may not see the result of their work. Think about that for a second. How dedicated, how committed, how passionate do you have to be about something to dedicate all your life to something, knowing that you may not reap the benefits of that work? That's profound, right? Because the unseen actions we take today create momentum for action, change, and visibility of tomorrow. The Million Man March was just that the act of million people. 
not one. The legalization of same-sex marriage was a result of decades of grassroots organizing from the local level, regional level, city level, state level, and then federally. Representation in Hollywood has taken 100 years to get to where we are, and we're still not done yet. Alas, the work continues, and that work is exhausting, relentless, futile even sometimes feeling. But we persist because we have each other to pick each other up on the bad days, but also because we care about creating a better world for ourselves, for others around us, and for those who have yet to come. Little babies. But there is a counter narrative. There's this feeling of needing to create more visibility all the time, right? Like we've all seen a few too many of these self-congratulatory congratulatory posts. And we've probably all been, you know, guilty of doing it ourselves. Congrats, bro. <laughs> um, and sometimes the content is just, what? Why is this on here? Why? What are we doing? Uh, sorry for anyone who's really into lawn care. It's, it's all about communities. Um, but my point is, the, the algorithm is locked in. We're locked into that. And that's problematic uh, for a lot of reasons, but mainly because it's paralyzing, right? We, we edit ourselves. We become performative. And we lose sight of what's important and what matters the most. And that hinders the ability for us to do the work that matters. This puts us back at square one a lot of times. We kind of don't know the rules. We feel like we have no agency in this. We're just kind of going with whatever the flow is. So what can we do? Big bro, Clay Shirky. It's like, I don't know. Um, but I read his books and he's a great author that focuses on new media. And you should check him out. He says, a revolution doesn't happen when society adopts new tools. It happens when society adopts new behaviors, right? And we're starting to wake up to that because we're starting to actually question the moral responsibility, the utility even, the limitations of tools like social media and AI. We're starting to change the way we talk about deeply personal experiences like mental health. Why? Because the power of people, the power of self-determinism is ever present. And that's the ticket. When we create space for ourselves to be ourselves, to embrace these ungraceful moments, we bestow a gift of belonging and purpose to each other. And when we have belonging and purpose, when we have those things, we're able to do the work. We're able to really, really deliver on that promise, right? And so when we're able to create more opportunities for each other, we get to cut through the distractions of all of it. Because the real questions are not about social media or feeling even invisible. The real questions are the long-standing human ones. What's my purpose? How do I get better? How do I fit in? How do I help? How do I live in this broken system? Don't get excited. I don't have answers to those questions for you. <laughs> but I do know one thing. We don't have to do it alone. We don't have to answer those questions alone. When you stare into the abyss, the unknown, and we're all doing it together, that's fine. But we can also remember that we can look around us, to the left, to the right, behind us. And we quickly realize then that being seen and seeing each other is not that difficult. When you find your people, you shoulder and share the work. You shoulder the pressure together. You shoulder the expectations. And you become free from those invisible moments. You start to be visible to those who matter the most. And sometimes you even realize that the people who matter the most are just yourself. And thus visibility doesn't matter anymore. That's an incredibly deep form of freedom. This freedom where we've connected so deeply that ironically we feel liberated. 
this ability to feel, feel free from algorithms or expectations or the need to impress. And when you're free like that, then you can do the sometimes relentless, sometimes thankless, but always worth doing work. Because when you take unseen actions today, you may help someone else down the line shine their light. Thank you.